Good morning and welcome to Prime Time. I am Deb Sullivan Trainer. I'm Acting Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences. And want to both first recognize what Prime Time is. It's a great collaboration between Friends of the Bethel Library, uh, Faculty Development, and a number of other offices so that we have a chance to listen, join in conversation, hear about all of the great learning experiences that happen outside the classroom. And part of that, obviously, that we're recognizing today is the importance of research. I do want to tell you about uh, two other, the two remaining primetime events coming up. Next Tuesday, we'll have the Faculty Excellence Award for Teaching. That's Professor of Art um, Ken Steinbach, and he'll be presenting on hard data and speculative thoughts about the nature of the creative process. And then our last primetime is Thursday, May 9th, and we'll see the presentation of the Library Research Award uh, that went to first place winner Matisse Murray. She'll be presenting Trees Nestled Among Skyscrapers, Frederick Law Olmsted, and the Creation of Central Park. So today we are welcoming uh, Dr. Jim Bilby. He is the uh, winner of the Faculty Excellence Award for Scholarship. These awards were established first for excellence in teaching and service in 1987, and then in 1991 we added to that scholarship because that's such an important part of the work of the faculty and especially when they do it in a collaborative way with students, which so many of our faculty do. Jim came to Bethel in uh, 2001. He has the bachelor's, uh, bachelor's degree from Northwestern, um, MAT, MATS from Bethel Seminary, and PhD from Marquette University. And when he was nominated, the way the Faculty Excellence Awards work is there that uh, faculty are nominated by their colleagues, and they present the information and why they think that this um, colleague is worthy of this award, and there's absolutely no doubt in my mind that Jim is. So this is what was written in that letter. Jim saw the publication of his first peer-reviewed journal article the same year he graduated from seminary with his MA degree. By the time he had earned his PhD in 2002, he had already been involved beyond his dissertation in the production of three books, seven journal articles, five book reviews, and a dozen conference, paper, conference papers and presentations. This alone is a stunning academic accomplishment. Since that time, Jim has maintained a similarly remarkable rate of scholarly production, including projects currently under contract and forthcoming. Jim has over a dozen books to his credit, either as co-editor or co-author, or editor or author, and he has around 30 published articles, essays, and over 20 scholarly papers and presentations. So it's my great pleasure to welcome Jim today and to hear um, him speak about the joys and frustrations of doing scholarship at Bethel. Thank you. Um, I actually count uh, this award as a great honor, all the more so because it comes from my colleagues. Um, it seems certainly appropriate that an award on scholarship would uh, actually have some scholarship presented at this, but I am actually not going to do that. Um, I had a paper on the uh, nature of divine inspiration sitting in the hopper and waiting to go. And then I decided kind of at the last minute uh, that it would be more authentic to who I am right now um, to actually talk more uh, about just the idea of scholarship and particularly some of uh, my reflections on it. Um, I usually am very comfortable doing kind of an extemporaneous thing, but I decided to go away from that and actually stick a little closer to a manuscript uh, in part because I want to be careful about how I say some of this. Uh, let me first offer some context for my comments. Uh, I will be speaking in the first person. These are going to be my joys and frustrations regarding scholarship, so I'm making no attempt to speak for all. Although I expect that some of what I say will resonate with others. And I'm speaking from a particular field of study, namely philosophy and theology. And some of what I say will be unique to those fields, but again I expect that people from very different fields will be able to resonate with uh, some of this stuff. And while I offer four joys and four different frustrations, I don't intend to convey the idea that my frustrations have rivaled the joys, either in intensity or number. I have loved the researching and writing that I have done thus far. Yet, ironically, this morning I'm going to offer these reflections from the nadir of my passion for writing and researching, for reasons that I will discuss and for reasons closely connected to some of my frustrations with scholarship. So I'm going to start with my frustrations. Um, not because they're the most important things, uh, but because I don't want them to have the last word this morning. My first frustration is that scholarship is expensive in lots of ways. 
uh, in terms of time, of course, and I'll talk more about that later, but also in terms of money. The dirty little secret is that getting ahead in the scholarly world involves nearly as much networking as writing. The relationship one builds at conferences provides the lion's share of one's writing opportunities. And in my experience, attending a single conference every year doesn't come close to getting it done. Bethel has worked hard to increase travel funding, for which I am thankful. But even a thousand dollars doesn't go very far when attending conferences. 400 for airfare, 169 per night for hotel, 30 dollars per day for food, three nights, gone. This can be stretched in a variety of ways, but two full-fledged conferences per year, probably not. And going overseas, for example, to Scotland for a conference on the Trinity, where I would have liked to have been this last week, no chance. In our current financial dire straits, who knows? I have been asked to be on a panel discussion on biblical authority and inerrancy at next year's ETS, EPS conference. I want to say yes, but I'm aware that our current financial situation is such that our travel funding might be cut. So I'm in the awkward situation of needing to respond to the program's chair's invitation without knowing whether Bethel's funding will be there. Further, I've already said no to another invitation for next year, knowing that I cannot count on having funding. The problem is, if you say no too many times, you tend to stop being asked. Consequently, it is difficult when your peers at other institutions have two, three, even eight times the available funding for travel. Last year, if I would have attended all the conferences I could have, and maybe should have attended, it would have cost well over $6,000. It is, of course, not reasonable, I'm not suggesting in any way that it is, that Bethel cover $6,000 per year per faculty member. I understand budgetary realities, but the functional cap of one or maybe two conferences per year is frustrating. I could have and could do much more with more financial support. My second frustration, scholarship may be expensive, but it is not lucrative. <laughs> this last year, all of my royalties from 11 books currently out, didn't even come close to one month's salary. Now, all of you being Bethel people know that that's not because my salary is just so massive. That's a lot of effort for relatively little financial gain. I don't even want to figure out the hourly wage, but I strongly suspect it wouldn't be half the wage earned by a 16-year-old flipping burgers at McDonald's. One way to address this tragic situation is to change my audience, and I've been tempted to try to write something for a more popular audience but I have thus far resisted the temptation. I am suspicious of what writing for a popular Christian audience would do to me and what intellectual compromise I might be tempted to make to sell books. And then there's the fact that I am desperately disinterested in the topics that seem to be most interesting to the popular Christian world. I may change my mind on this <coughs> in the future and decide to write something more popular, but that time is not now. Regardless, in a context where our salaries frozen yet again, and our retirement's been slashed, and given my situation of being the primary breadwinner, for most of my time here at Bethel, I was the only breadwinner, so this is an improvement, it is increasingly difficult to justify the amount of time required by serious academic scholarship. It's not impossible, but it is difficult. Third frustration, and I suppose you could say if the two previous uh, frustrations were financial in nature, this one is deeply personal. And uh, talking about it feels um, feels a little vulnerable, obviously. This frustration, I suppose you can simply phrase as, as an academic, I'm an odd duck. I'm fully aware that I'm preaching to the choir and offering this observation, and I see the faces uh, that would be happy to offer all the various ways that I am an odd duck. But my weirdness relative to my academic setting while probably being multifaceted, includes the fact that I have a deep and profound need to balance my thinking and writing with physical effort. I need to work with my hands. And I have to have some sort of athletic goal that I'm working toward. This isn't a like, as in, I kind of like to take a stroll outside and get some fresh air. This is a, I need to get outside and move around some boulders in a bobcat, or pound a nail, or try to hit a 330 yard drive. Good trajectory, little draw. <laughs> or I will go crazy sort of thing. I'm not claiming that I'm completely unique in this respect, but I don't think it's a common affliction among PhDs. And the intensity of my particular strain of the affliction is probably quite unique. But there's more. 
Something in this neighborhood has left me feeling pretty isolated here at Bethel and has affected my scholarly efforts in a variety of ways. To the degree, actually, that I found myself wondering if I would be able to stay in academia for my entire career. This feeling was never so intense as two years ago when I spent 12 to uh, 16 hours a day all summer building a house for my family. In that time, I worked shoulder to shoulder with an incredibly culturally diverse group, Czechoslovakian and Nigerian, a crew of Mexicans, Guatemalan, South African, a pair of recent immigrants from Poland, and an entire crew of Russian painters, in addition to a few who looked like me. What was striking is that despite our cultural differences, I felt entirely at home with this group. We were on the same wavelength in our conversations, even with those whose English was not strong, were clear, focused, and a joy. These were, I felt, my people. As a side note, for those who would speculate that my positive experience flowed from the fact that I was the general contractor, i.e. the boss, and therefore they had to be nice to me, I would respond that my experience was very much the same when I was a rookie grunt on a framing crew in 1986. This experience stood in sharp contrast to my experience arriving at faculty retreat at the end of that summer. Despite the fact that I looked like many, most of you, I had the overwhelming sensation, overwhelming sensation that I am no longer among my people. Now I want to say this carefully. I don't mean to suggest in any way my Bethel colleagues are bad people or unfriendly or anything like that. Quite the opposite. What I'm saying to that is even among those for whom I have enormous appreciation, there is a real disconnect. I feel like the other. I don't know how to explain this, but I'm perfectly willing to take the blame. It's not you, it's me. But what? What about me? Is it my lower class, middle lower class uh, upbringing? Is it the fact that I spent my formative years in a rural context, a small framing, uh, farming and dairy town in Wisconsin? Is it a blue collar, get your hands dirty set of va values? Is it that I am the absolute polar opposite of indirect and passive aggressive and therefore not at all uh, a comfortable person for Swedish people to be around? <laughs> Is it that despite shambling around in this aging, crusted, and increasingly decrepit body, I still have the mindset of an athlete? Or was it simply that I did not have to correspond with the people on my uh, crew that summer via C faculty? <laughs> Don't be too quick to dismiss that, latter, that last point. We talk a lot about cultural diversity at Bethel, and rightly so. But culture is much more complicated than race and ethnicity. If we broaden our notion of culture, we might see diversity that we have until now missed. And we might find ways to make other odd ducks faculty, staff, and especially our students feel more at home here at Bethel. My final frustration is probably my most significant one. It's my most significant frustration regarding scholarship currently, but it's simultaneously also my biggest joy in life. Compared to when I arrived at Bethel, my situation has changed, and that has required now a change in how I think about scholarship. Some of you know that I have four kids. Sierra's 15, Maddie is 13, Zach is 11, and scary as it is to me, my baby just turned nine, Malia. My oldest was born when I was finishing my final semester of PhD coursework. So I have many distinct memories of holding a baby, a bottle, and a book, or outlining papers in my head as I paced the floor with a teething or colicky baby. But when my kids were young, I was still able to carve out time to write. I wrote from 10 until 2, or during the naps. I found time. It wasn't a huge problem. But now that my kids are older, it is a huge problem. This might seem counterintuitive, but I have talked with others in the same boat and their opinion is the same. Older kids require way more time, not to mention money. I think that the adage about quality time with kids is a lie. Kids, kids need, they may need quality time, but they need quantity time. You don't get to hear about the boy who asked out your 15-year-old daughter in five quality minutes. It comes out after a four-hour car ride to Duluth and back, at least two hours of which were spent listening to Taylor Swift in One Direction. <laughs> an appalling experience for an, <coughs> an unrepentant metalhead like myself. In this respect, I like my daughter's, my youngest daughter, Malia's musical taste much better. I still have Lion King bouncing around my head from last night. Consequently, for the reasons that I've mentioned, that my kids just are at a stage where they just need so much more focused attention on my part, uh, not just quali 
quality time, but quantity time, coaching their athletic teams and everything that goes with that. I find myself in a situation, despite the fact that I really truly love writing and I really truly love researching, I can no longer justify spending as much time on writing as I have in the past. Enough about my frustrations. Let's talk about some joys. And while there are many, I'm just going to mention four. The first, I suppose you could title it this, The Beauty of a Written Page with a Single Line of Text and the Rest is Footnotes. <laughs> or an Ode to 100 Page Bibliographies. Or Paul, Ed Paul Eddy's Idea of Heaven. <clears throat> There's something enormously satisfying about the obviously futile attempt to accumulate and digest the complete range of material on a given subject. My first attempt here, and there was a bunch of topics on which I uh, tried this, was with respect to the problem of evil. I started this bibliography when I was doing my master's work. I had strongly suspected it might be something that I'd want to turn into a dissertation topic. Uh, it started with trying to get everything in the last 30 years that was written. Um, and so it got pretty large, and I decided this is just crazy. So I have to limit myself. So it's now everything in the last 10 years. And that got so large, I decided, okay, I'm going to try to just get everything from 1990 to 1997. And when I stopped doing that, it was 63 pages, single space, 10 point font. Um, and then I gave up the task. But that process, the obvious futility of the attempt to <coughs> catalog, to understand, to at some level digest uh, all these works did not detract from the satisfaction gleaned in the attempt. Early on, much of my scholarship had this nature. But from these silly encyclopedic attempts, I learned a great deal. Of course, I learned how to research the uh, art, I suppose you could call it, of finding the key word to search for. But less obviously, I learned that there is no such thing as one way to approach a subject. It's amazing the diversity of topics you can get just on something as simple, if you want to call it simple, as evil, and the problem of evil and how you relate God to that. Theological topics are prisms that scatter a dizzying array of different colored light in all directions. And when I learned this, with this lesson came the realization that while not all approaches are created equal, there's some really, really bad approaches to various topics out there. Well, not all approaches are created equal. There's no approach that one cannot learn something from. So I learned to appreciate the myriad ways that issues, questions, and debates are approached and tried to gain a perspective that allowed me to understand the, dizzy, the dizzying variety of perspectives. To this day, one of the things that I find uh, in terms of academics most fun is to take all the different ways that our issues are approached and try to juxtapose them and think about them into each other and think about how they bounce off each other. That sort of global thinking is something that I really enjoy. Second uh, joy of scholarship for me, <clears throat> you'd say it's the advantage of working collaboratively, especially with good friends. I don't see myself as the ultimate team player. In college, I had nothing but disdain for group projects. And during my time here at Bethel, I have occasionally viewed, maybe unfairly, uh, committee meetings as opportunities to take the most amount of time to get the least amount of work done. <laughs> I've loved teaching from day one. Um, pardon me, I jumped, I jumped topics there. I don't see myself as the ultimate uh, team player. But when I started writing for publication, my dim view of collaboration changed significantly, and pretty quickly. To date, I have co-authored or co-edited seven books and six essays. It hasn't been uniformly positive. Co-authoring uh, brings echoes of Dickens' famous line, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times. <laughs> in some circumstances, co-authorship is ideal. In others, an utter and complete disaster. Early on, I almost lost a very, very close friend over a very difficult collaboration, such that it made me extremely careful about who I actually do collaborate with in research. But in 1993, I met Paul Eddy. Our early collaborations involved in helping each other work through our dissertation outlines. That process was so helpful that in a hotel room 
in Orlando in 1998 while at the Evangelical Theological Society Conference, Paul and I decided to dive into the task of co-editing a multiple views book on a contentious issue at the time, divine foreknowledge. From that uh, process, from that uh, task, uh, came volumes on atonement, <coughs> historical Jesus, justification, and spiritual warfare. And maybe, if we ever get around to it, on some others as well in the future. I could not have done these by myself, and looking back, I wouldn't want to try. Paul's writing style, skill set, approach to questions, and network of relationships were just different enough for mine to be complementary and similar enough to be comfortable. I have no doubt that I would not be up here today without Paul's collaboration. So, Paul, thank you. I would encourage my colleagues and my students, actually, for that matter, to have a different perspective than I've had at various times in my life about the idea of collaboration. I would encourage you to do as much collaborative work as you can. There's real benefits in it. I think you can learn a lot and do a lot more together than you can do by yourself. Not with Paul, though. Get your own co-author. <laughs> <laughs> Academic collaboration is difficult, but it is worth it. <clears throat> Third, uh, joy, scholarship. The fruitfulness of teaching introductory classes like Christian theology. I'll admit, Christian theology is probably my favorite class here to teach. It's not that my upper-level classes aren't fun or I don't feel like I gain anything from them, but there's something amazing about teaching introductory classes like this. Early on, I'd heard that teaching could help your scholarship. When I heard that, again, early on, frankly, I thought it was a load of crap. I've loved teaching from day one. Uh, very first class I ever taught here in 1999, uh, being asked three days ahead of time to pick up a section that was going to be taught by Greg Boyd, and walking into that class and having the students thinking I was his TA, and then being forced <laughs> to tell them that they weren't going to get Greg Boyd, that they had to take me for this class. Start didn't start well. Um, <laughs> but from day one, I've enjoyed teaching. I've loved it. But at that time, I, had, I could not see how teaching could help me on the subjects that I was working on. Then I was thinking about trying to work through arcane aspects of religious epistemology. Today I sheepishly but happily admit that my early attitude was a perfect example of the stupidity or maybe just ignorance of youth. In the past 10 years I have seen many tangible examples where my lecture prep and in-class discussions have forced me to think differently and better about various areas of scholarship. Let me offer just one brief example. It was through teaching Christian theology that I became dissatisfied was the standard evangelical account of divine inspiration, the verbal plenary theory. And it was through engaging the questions of my students that I came up with a different account that I think has all the advantages of the verbal plenary theory without the disadvantages. Of course, there is no one question that brought about that revelation. There's no one comment that made me think, oh, then this is the way I need to take this. Rather, it was the process of preparing lectures, answering tough questions on those lectures, and then revising my presentation, and that process repeated again and again and again that allowed me to get at these insights. For me, one of the insights that I've had here is that there's a real advantage of teaching classes that are at a very high level of abstraction, senior level classes, but also simultaneously teaching these introductory level classes. And I've tried to set for myself a goal of, with respect to my introductory level classes that I never let my lecture outlines become reified and static and given such that I just know what I'm going to teach, say, before I get in there, that I constantly, or if not constantly, at least every other year significantly visit and revise those lectures to take into account the questions and comments that uh, I've been getting along the way. It's difficult and it's annoying because you never feel like you're set and comfortable and you know what you're going to say, but I think the uh, effect on your scholarship, on your ways of thinking about these subjects is really profound. My final joy is uh, regarding my scholarship, especially here at Bethel, is the fruitfulness of thinking within a community that takes a theological stance but allows for self-reflective and even self-critical research. Bethel has been, and I hope will remain, firmly ensconced in the evangelical pietist theological tradition. This gives our institution some important distinctives. In particular, we eschew the narrow polemics of many evangelical institutions, 
but we operate from within a clear commitment to a theological notion that many former Christian institutions regard as egregiously archaic, namely the authority and inerrancy of Scripture. These distinctives have made Bethel an amazing place from which to do scholarship. I submit, and I think I can defend the idea, that at Bethel we have more academic freedom than at the vast majority of other institutions. And that's because we can explore issues to our right, theologically, as well as left. And we can do so from, with a, from a clear stance. When I asked George Rushauer's opinion about my intention to write an article reconsidering the standard evangelical theory on divine inspiration, the verbal plenary theory, he gave me his blessing, and happily and quickly. But he also made it clear to me that while he wanted me to follow scholarship wherever it took me, to look at whatever subject that I thought was crucial and important and worthwhile, that Bethel as an institution could not follow me wherever I might want to go. Jay has echoed that exact same sentiment on a number of times to me. And I found and find this refreshing. The trick for us here at Bethel is to continue to live in this tension. We value faith and Christian commitment above all else. We are not willing to dispense with what Scripture teaches, even if it is convenient for us to do so. But we are willing to push students to give them a battle-tested faith. Our maintaining this tension matters to our students, and it matters to our broader constituency. From a market point of view, we have an amazing niche. But it's not just a given that we will remain in this niche. We have to work to protect it. My prayer for Bethel is that we continue to be clear about who we are theologically and where we are going. And I pray that, from within this clear perspective, we will continue to push our students to understand everything that they need to know to be used by Christ to further his kingdom. Even if it is uncomfortable, even if it challenges the status quo, and even if it leaves us with unanswered questions. I deliberately left uh, a fair amount of time because I would like to actually talk about some of this. Um, I think this is important for us uh, generically, generally here at Bethel, how we think about scholarship. I'm uh, very aware that we not only have other scholars here, but we have at least a couple of past uh, people that have been uh, given this award in the past. So um, comments or, uh, or, or questions or especially comments. Given your joys and frustrations, um, do you have any thoughts about, for, for maybe a newer academic, how do, how do, how does someone like me or someone in this crowd then move forward at Bethel to have more of the joys and less of those frustrations? Um, find your Paul Eddie. Yeah, <laughs> that was a good. That was a good comment. No, I, I mean, I mean that. I mean that's flippantly, but I mean that very seriously. Find a group of people with whom you can uh, engage issues in a really deep way and just throw them around. And somebody who's willing to like look you in the eye and tell you, Steve, I like you. I think you're a smart guy, but this idea you have is stupid. Right? If you don't find somebody that's willing to do that, then forget it. Right? You, you have to have somebody that's willing to be brutally honest with you and and, to, and steer you. Uh, when it's appropriate. So find a group of people that that will help you do that. Um, and then the other thing I guess I would say is to network. Networking really matters. Um, and connecting with other people that are doing similar things in other places uh, is enormously fruitful. I mean, I actually wrote this sentence that I used. Uh, Scholarship requires as much networking as it does writing. And I paused and I'm like, that's just outrageous. I can't believe I just wrote that. I'm like, but it's right. It's true. Right? You can be a scholar and do write amazing stuff in your little you know, cubicle or in your office or whatever it be, but the way to get that out there and the way to have it battle tested is through a series of relationships, right? through that sort of networking. And so that's absolutely crucial. So that would be two quick things that I would advise, um, that I would encourage you toward. And I guess the follow-on to the networking, given the financial constraints, have you found any ways to make that happen on the cheap, so to speak? 
don't. <laughs> uh, I wish I could say something. I feel like I should say something more positive here. Um, I mean, it's a little bit of a help to develop relationships and have conversations, you know, via email. But most of this happens at conferences. Most of this happens not even in papers at conferences, but at dinner after the papers, sitting around talking for four hours. Uh, that's when the relationships are built that then open doors in the future. Um, and there's, so there's no real substitute for just, uh, again, interesting, this is coming up two different places, quantity time and having the opportunity to just be there. Um, <coughs> That's the primary way to do it. Hotel rooms, the first. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Hotel rooms, restaurants after the meeting, pubs, whatever. Right. Mm -hmm. I I uh, I've found collaboration to be also similarly really useful and also sometimes thing. But can you talk maybe a little bit more sort of about you know, in depth in terms of what it is about working with someone else on an idea, how that feels, how that makes possible other, you know, for, you know, furthering an, an, an idea or a project or whatever. Right. Well, I mean, some of it, I mean, the easiest part is just there's <laughs> overlapping but not the same skill sets when you're working with somebody. Um, Paul's going to start blushing here, so I'll just kick him all the way under the bus. Um, Paul is the master researcher. I've never met anybody who researches like Paul. I mean, he hunts down sources that I was like, I had no clue they were there, and I don't think anybody knows that they're there. Maybe not even the authors who, who author, right? <laughs> um, and he brings all this together, and, and he, so he's just so much better at that than, than I. What do I bring to the table? <laughs> Maybe nothing. Um, uh, I. I, when, we, when we engage, I am the, okay, let's pull this all together. I am the, this doesn't make any sense. I am the, now, okay, the main point has to be here, so how do we get here? I'm the big picture guy and Paul's the detail guy. It's interesting because in other collaborative relationships I've had, I've shifted roles and had to be the detail guy and somebody, and I've seeded the global thinking big picture role to somebody else. Um, so a big part of it is simply just different sets of skills. Um, but also a big part of it, because this is, this is, scholarship is a very communal exercise, it's different sets of relationships. So we could look at some of the, the books that Paul and I have collaborated on, right, and think of, look at you know, various different contributors that we eventually got to come in and say, okay, Paul, that was Paul's connection. Okay, that one was mine. That was Paul's connection, that one was mine. If we'd have done just a single author, I wouldn't have had the ends and the connections with people that Paul would have had, and vice versa for, for uh, um, him. So, so the, not just the different skill set, but the different set of relationships, the different set of networks uh, that you bring to the uh, equation. Um, and you know what, more than that, I suppose, there's just something really fun about talking about this together. Now, I mean, you can you can do that just by finding some friends to, okay, here's my project I'm working on, this sort of thing. You know, it's kind of meant for, here's some things I'm working on, let's talk about these, and it can be really helpful. But, you know, a person who's, here's, here, here's my advice on your project, that can sometimes be really helpful. Well, what's really helpful is here's our project, right, and here's how we want to make this as good as it could possibly be. So there's a real advantage. And of course, you know, not just with Paul, Steve Enderlein and I have worked together on some projects. A good friend of mine named Chad Meister um, at uh, actually Bethel, Indiana, I've worked together uh, on some projects. So there, there's, uh, I've had a number of different collaborations, but those are some of the places, some of the places where I think it's helpful. Yeah, you tend to sense, a, uh, have a sense of vulnerability sometimes when you're doing this, or like, I'm not good enough, or I'm, a challenge, or how do I disagree with him and still maintain a an honest relationship? That kind of thing. 
I actually never have had a hard time disagreeing with Paul. Um, <laughs> I'm kind of kidding. Um, yeah, well, I think it's 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 difficult. Well, it's, there's first, there's the friendship there. Usually, how do you how do you maintain that and yet, you know, push back and iron sharpens iron and all that sort of thing. That's a that's absolutely part. Uh, that's actually a big part of it. But I would say even more generally, unless you're really willing to kind of be that vulnerable and to put yourself out there completely, the the process of scholarship can be a dangerous one. Um, a collaborative scholarship can be a dangerous one. You don't want to like, you know, okay, here, yeah, I suppose this is a great way to go, but in your mind be thinking, yeah, this is, we shouldn't be doing this. And then about three weeks before publication, go, this really stinks, right? So there has to be a willingness to kind of put it all out there at each stage of the process to avoid getting yourself in trouble. And I think probably one of the keys for, you know, if you want to engage in, in collaborative research with somebody, collaborative scholarship with somebody, one of the requirements you should have is are they willing to be sort of completely blunt, honest with you about, you know, what you're saying makes sense or what is, what they're, what, what's being done, does that make sense? Um, and probably Paul and I work well because I think we do, we do that with each other. So it does help to do this with close friends. Time for one more question. Comment? Um, I'll just make a comment. Um, so, having it taken two classes from you and reading a couple of your books, too, um, I just think you do a really good job of balancing the scholarship with lifestyle because, I mean, there's a lot of people who can write a lot of scholarly things that just would go way over my head and, you know, leave those theological terms just like to someone else to deal with because I don't know what to do with them, but the way that you teach, um, like, and being a family man and being a coach and all this, like, it just really is, is a good testimony or a good, um, I don't know, I just, you know, like, maybe it's what makes you an odd duck, I don't know, but I don't know, it's just like, I feel so blessed and lucky to have someone who can be that scholarly writing works that are like at a level way beyond what I could even really want to strive to be at, but just, and have it connect with me and with just seeing the way you live your life and the way that you teach and who you are, so. Actually, uh, it doesn't get much better than that. <laughs> Thank you.